Let's imagine a world where the New York Times wants to be bigger than just their newspaper and they really want to reach out and build this concept of an ecosystem around the New York Times. And one example of that could be that all New York Times subscribers get one month access to Spotify. So like, that's like an idea. Like imagine what innovation could happen with anyone could now create programs for Starbucks and like tap into what Starbucks has. I don't know what those experiences could be, but I'm here for them. So the technology isn't the challenge. It's the imagination that we need to inspire in order to think about why we're actually doing this, what's the purpose, and who is supporting this. We have a journey that we've been taking people on called the membership journey, which is a framework that we've created based on what we've seen in the space that takes people from kind of stage one of not doing anything on blockchains as it relates to membership, all the way to creating kind of a fully self-sustaining community based on membership. Hello, and welcome back to the Brand Next podcast. I'm your host, Justin Payton. I'm also the writer of the Brand Next newsletter, where we dive in and explore the use cases that are driving adoption and positive change through Web3 and metaverse technologies. If that sounds interesting, you can subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcast service, or you can also subscribe to the newsletter at brandnext.substack.com to get it all. Today, I'm joined by Patrick Workman. Patrick is part of the team behind Unlock Protocol and is busy building out the future of customer engagement through Web3 using membership and subscriptions. He brings an amazing track record of building and scaling successful experience platforms uh, and protocols with Google, Pinterest, and Instagram. So why Web3 and why subscriptions? Well, his view on what subscriptions really mean and what membership can really mean is fascinating and hugely impactful. You're going to have to listen to hear it directly from him, though. So let's dive in. Hello, Patrick. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Brand X podcast. We are lucky today to have a really fantastic builder on the program with us. We've got Patrick, who's building out Unlock Protocol, and I won't try to introduce people. I've found that I can never do that as well as they can themselves. So Patrick, can you do us a favor and tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for having me today. I've been looking forward to this conversation. A little about me. I live in Brooklyn with my wife and two daughters, and I'm building Unlock Protocol, which is an open source protocol that's been creating memberships as NFTs since 2018. So well before NFTs were cool, uh, Julian Genesau, who's a brilliant technologist, launched Unlock Protocol in order to create memberships, just happened to be NFTs. I joined Julian six months ago. Before Unlock, I worked across big tech and partnership roles at Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, Google, and a couple others in there that I'm sure we can chat about. <laughs> Fantastic. So you know the challenges that existed, the challenges you're trying to solve, and you know them all firsthand. Uh, I think you could say that and learning more challenges as the days go on. <laughs> On the topic, I don't want to waste too much time, but it would be crazy to not ask, given a weekend that we've just had with crypto going, I don't know how to describe the soap opera of FTX and what's actually happening there. It would be impossible not to ask about kind of your perception on what's happening and what you think it means for the world of Web3 beyond crypto. Yeah, so I think every any time crypto or block space is at the forefront of story and the media is picking up on what happened with FTX and kind of the rise and fall in the course of 72 hours to kind of a massive fortune is, is a great story. And we're obviously going to see dramatic impact to reputation and credibility of the space, just like anything like this Whenever something like this happens, this is what we run into. I see what's happening on that side of cryptocurrency as speculation being the product. And that's not a space that Unlock Protocol is playing in, or I think Web3 is playing in. Web3 is creating tokens to improve social coordination and just new novel ways of creating really great experiences. Trading cryptocurrencies, that's a, that's a casino. That's people that are speculating on what's going to go up and what's going to go down. I don't make tokens go up, I make tokens. I think that you've, listen, this is exactly this, uh, we share this perspective, right? I think the challenge that we have as an industry is that we have allowed, the, whether it's the media or ourselves, 
to just you be lazy and use a common set of terms. Maybe it's just too young an industry. So we use a common set of terms and metaverse can mean anything. Web3 can mean anything. Crypto can mean anything. They all mean the same thing. In actual fact, they, they can be quite different, like you say. One is the product is speculation and the other, the product is trusted relationships is the way I think those products sit. In that case, tell us a bit more about what you are building and the tokens that you build and what Unlock Protocol is all about. Yeah. So Unlock creates memberships. Those memberships are NFTs. Those NFTs, not to get too technical, are ELC721s. Most NFTs, when people think about what that represents, are ERC721s. ERC and what Unlock is, it's a system that's taken that ERC721 standard, injected it with steroids, and given it superpowers. Uh, one of those superpowers is the ability to put time constraints within a contract. And for non-Web3 natives, it's like, well, it's an expiration date. What does that actually mean? It's like, well, on blockchains, actually having an expiration date in a contract is important because then it creates tokens that expire. And if a token can expire, it means you can create recurring revenue models through paid memberships, subscriptions, tickets, certifications, ways to actually generate revenue through activity that's occurring on a permissionless computer in the sky. It's completely decentralized. And I think the permissionless part of that story is important because this really enables anyone to establish a peer-to-peer -peer financial relationship with somebody else without the need for a third-party platform or central payment processor. And if you can put that into the hands of creators broadly, whether that be as large as a Netflix to kind of a local coffee shop or an artist, that's really powerful. And these are tools that have never been available in the past. And that's the, that's the part of the technology that really excites me. So let's get a bit more specific about that, because I think that the perception that exists is that, you know, as a subscription, I've subscribed to the New York Times for a very long time. It's a recurring subscription. It expires. If I don't pay my bill, I stop getting access. I don't actually, I live in Singapore. I don't actually get the physical paper. I stop getting access to more than, I don't know, maybe three articles a month. I don't know what the rules are these days, but you get the idea. How is this really different? Let's dive into that permissionless side and what that really means. If you can give me an example of what it would be in a web two space versus a web three space, that would be great. Yeah, and I think the newspaper analogy is a good one to build off of. So why would a publisher move what they're doing today to block space. And I've, I've been a Wall Street Journal analog subscriber since 1997. I do get the New York Times on the weekends. So I actually am one of the rare birds that reads a physical paper every morning in addition to getting my news digitally. In the case of the New York Times, what they have in that subscriber relationship is single player. And what I mean by that is you pay monthly, you receive access, if you don't pay monthly, you do not receive access. And it's very transactional. And most relationships are transactional and kind of boring like that. Because from the New York Times, everything that's happening within their universe is contained to you paying with a credit card and being a line on a server in some customer database somewhere saying that this is you as a subscriber. And that's as far as the relationship goes. Well. Let's imagine a world where the New York Times wants to be bigger than just their newspaper and they really want to reach out and build this concept of an ecosystem around the New York Times. And one example of that could be that all New York Times subscribers get one month access to Spotify. So like, that's like an idea. Let's say that if you were a New York Times subscriber, you would get access to a token enabled marketplace where you could explore deals from all of the advertisers or sponsors of the New York Times. So that could be something else. And then like, let, let's see like where our minds could really go in terms of a partnerships perspective, almost considering, you know, you receive those credit card offers from American Express and you can yeah. pick and select kind of what merchants you want to get the discount from. Let's imagine a world where the New York Times could create partnerships directly. And then there's also partnerships that are created indirectly 
all based upon people that are a subscriber, one token within a contract address that the New York Times has. So this is one public contract address that's uh, 28 letters and numbers that anyone indirectly or directly could plug in and enable experiences based upon somebody owning a token on that address. This becomes really powerful because the tech lift to create those types of experiences is way too daunting today. And in many cases, illegal because you're taking customer databases and matching it with another customer database and you're hashing information and you're syncing and IT teams are getting angry at you for even suggesting such a silly thing with public blockchains and contracts and tokens on those contracts, you're just exchanging an address and you're plugging playing into each of these token enabling, these token enabled experiences in order to really create something powerful. So the interoperability that's created within that universe is where I see there being a lot of opportunity. New York Times in a single player game, there's no reason for them to do a subscription as an NFT. Like it would just create friction and they would be better suited just having something in their customer database. If they want to be bigger than what they are and really expand, that's where blockchains get exciting. The things that you mentioned around all of a sudden creating new value for the relationship they have with their advertisers, huge opportunity. I mean, let's be honest, the static ads that exist sometimes feel antiquated, even on a digital platform, they can feel antiquated. So that idea of how you can make all of this dynamic lifelike and start to create new opportunities for partnership, huge opportunity. Yeah, really interesting. When we think about this though, I've kind of heard you talk and listen to some of the things that you talk with people about. You think of membership at a whole number of levels, right? You start talking about ticketing as a membership. You start talking about all these other use cases and describing them as if they're memberships. So ticketing, token gating, these sorts of things. Can you talk about a few of the other use cases that you really think are enabled and are going to get exciting as this kind of matures? Yeah. So for us, membership is a broad catch-all for a new business model for the web. Today, the web is built upon an attention, a business model of attention. So the incentive for any tech platform is to generate as much of your attention in the form of time spent on their platform so they can then package you as you your attention to an advertiser who then wants to reach you in order because you've met some criteria so that they could sell you what they want to sell you. And that's kind of the relationship today. We feel that membership from a transactional perspective is going to be a better way for the web to operate because it aligns incentives that aren't based upon getting someone to spend more time kind of on a set platform. It provides the incentive of whatever that publisher or platform or service or entity are providing, they're now creating and people are kind of paying for the experience to be a part of that in the form of membership. And, and if you, the reason we think of membership broadly, it could be membership within a community. It could be a membership within your block. It could be a your Netflix subscription is a membership within Netflix it just isn't a very good membership program because you don't really get a lot. It's very transactional. Going back to my kind of single player, multiplayer analogy, Amazon Prime, they call me a member. I've never seen my membership card. I actually don't care what it looks like, just like I don't care what an image of an NFT membership would look like. I care about the utility of what my membership within Amazon Prime represents. But even then, it's confined to the Amazon kind of environment. Other memberships would be a ticket, whether to a concert or a conference over multiple nights. You were a member to one night or kind of an event. From a certification perspective, if you receive a driver's license or a passport, you are a member of that thing, that community, that organization, that entity that's the issuer of that credential verifying that you are someone within this ecosystem. And in this new permissionless membership world, who wins? Let me just continue the question. Because if we look at the model that exists right now, I would argue that, you know, you named it. It's like Prime won. They won. And scale, scale wins in that world. In this world, does scale still win? Or do we start to see a model where the interoperability lets everyone kind of compete in a different level? 
it's a big question. And I think it even goes like, fun, to, I think it even goes to, to fundamentally, like what does winning mean? Is winning being it, having the biggest bag of cash? Is winning having the most people and the most and smartest people? Or is winning kind of more intimate and kind of creating more value? Or I think even for me, I would see a win is democratizing the ability for others to just insert themselves into what they want to build and build faster. So one of the jumps in my career was I attempted to start a social network for live music fans called fans.com. The idea behind it was we had created a events engine where every concert that had occurred anywhere in the United States and in some areas in Europe, we had an archive of every single show that had happened. And the idea was the people that had attended those shows could go and comment, post photos, post things that if you're going to attend a show, you could check into that show and see if you knew anyone that was going to be at the show, chat with them, kind of meet up, those types of tools. That idea in 2017 could not work. The reason it couldn't work is there was way too much friction to connect the people when they were going to or during an event. And the reason there was friction is because that data lives within the databases of Ticketmaster, Access, and other major ticket providers. So the data that we needed in order to launch that a service like that was not possible because it was held in a corporate database. Now, let's flip the script of that and think of if all that information was in a big public data lake and not just the information from the ticketing companies, but let's say that these data warehouses from Google and Facebook and Pinterest and Shopify and Spotify, New York Times, and Twitter, and everything was poured into this massive warehouse that we could then extract from, that cold start problem wouldn't exist anymore. And the level of innovation for people that want to create great experiences based upon these signals would then be democratized. So I, I think the inter- innovation has been stifled because of large corporate databases of stuff and consumer information that they're using for their purposes, releasing that and then enabling everyone to use that data to build off of, I think will really inspire kind of innovation like we've never seen before. I think you're also dealing with more accurate data because we'll buy someone else tickets. Ticketmaster will have my name as the purchaser. It's not about custody. It's not about who has the ticket. It's about whose credit card actually made the purchase. And so they will have one record that isn't always the name of the person who's going to go to continue with the kind of concert example. And even in that example too, it's the uh, like, who is the person that's going to the show? And if you look at how many middlemen are involved in that transaction, like you have, you have a ticketing company, you have a credit card processor, you have a kind of redemption mechanism that maybe that ticketing company has, or maybe some third party kind of when you go to that venue. You also have kind of the the credit card processor, a credit card, a bank. Like there's so many people involved in that transaction where if there was a peer-to-peer transaction of I want ticket, I buy ticket, I have ticket, and then did I use ticket, yay or nay? And if those signals were publicly available, people could create some really rad things. I'm actually confident that in, it's going to take a little while, but in 2024, my initial idea for fans, I think somebody will build that. I'm going to be too old at the time, but there are entrepreneurs that are pursuing similar dreams. And I think that blockchain will make those dreams come true in a couple of years. I find it hard to believe that you will be too old at that point in time to get into that. I will not be too old. I will not be too old to advise those individuals. I will be too old. (laughs) I can understand it is, that is a late night game. Listen, I think that all of a sudden creates a whole new relationship. And if we kind of extrapolate that out and look at it at from not just the how do I connect with other people who are going, but then the musicians can have a relationship with who went to their show and say, here, have a live track from that show and start to, as you say, you will remember, I'll give you a reward for whatever it happens to be. I'll kind of cement that relationship in one way or another. So this becomes a hugely interesting element. And like you say, I think we're just scratching the surface of where the innovation is going to come from. I actually actually don't even think we've we've come close to scratching anything. I think the experiments that we've seen over the course of the past couple of years have been, the majority have been very experimental. 
we have a journey that we've been taking people on called the membership journey, which is a framework that we've created based upon what we've seen in the space that takes people from kind of stage one of not doing anything on blockchains as it relates to membership, all the way to creating kind of a fully self-sustaining community based on membership where there's strong identity to be part of a group and community and people are kind of driving ongoing value from just being part of that. In terms of stages one through five at Utopian Vision, um, very few projects are even on stage three where they've moved beyond digital collectibles as kind of the reason for a project. Many of the early experiments have felt somewhat forced as to you could probably do this better with a customer database, but NFTs sound trendy and novel, so let's plug some NFTs in and see if this is going to make it better. And when forced, it isn't better. Like if you're creating additional friction for somebody, you're not creating a better experiment. So we're just seeing kind of a wave of new internet pioneers explore time-based memberships, ticketing, and really have like documented strategies about what value they're going to create outside of what their NFT looks like. As you described that stage two of PFP and digital collectible, if we want real adoption, because I don't care how many people say that, isn't it great that you can, that you can collect this? Most people are never going to be interested in collecting just digital collectibles for the sake of it. Most people don't collect things in the first place. I think we've got to find value beyond just the ability to collect. My favorite membership, I think would probably be my Amazon membership. I have no idea what that looks like though. I'm not flexing my Amazon Prime membership as a profile pick. It's just not something that I would do. And I, I think that as we see the space evolve, we'll see less of the kind of digital collectible angle and more how can we, why are we using NFTs? What purpose are we creating? And what are these interoperable experiences that we'll unlock as a result of, kind of shared ownership? of a token on a contract address. You say that, and yet I would really love to take all the metadata that Amazon has about everyone and create trait-based NFTs for their Prime membership and see what, what the different traits would actually look. Would, I mean, you could do a lot with all of that. You could. I think the question becomes like, how many people will care? It's great to see early experimentation and individuals looking to kind of do something differently. I'm fortunate enough, I'm in a position at Unlock where through my role of stoking growth and partnerships, I get to have conversations with many of those early internet kind of explorers. And over the past six months, I've had probably 700 plus conversations with different individuals that are either crypto native, crypto curious, they could either be very large, very small from a scale perspective. And it's been really encouraging over the past 60 days to just hear the difference in tone from those that are still here. Kind of the hype and speculation has been, the majority of that has been sucked out of the market. So the people that are building now are really thinking about like, what is the purpose? And really being thoughtful around why they're exploring in uh, with blockchains versus thinking that they could latch on to some form of novelty or speculation that would make their tokens go up. I do think over the next six months or so, we're going to see a lot more thoughtful experiments. Yeah, I hope so. I think that's true. I, I work with quite a few brands and I can say that the momentum's just picking up, which has not bullish on the speculation side, but definitely bullish on the technology side. Yeah, if you're looking to speculate, there's many places to do that. Sometimes crypto works really well until it doesn't. Uh, the same as most speculation games. Well, when it's working. You look really smart when all your tokens are going up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm good at not selling them after they go up and waiting until they go down, though. That, that's the problem that I have. I'm very good at watching them go up and then back down again. But getting back to talking about how this works for brands, I, th I think it's really interesting. I talk a lot and we work with a lot of brands who don't have that direct relationship, right? With CPG brands, most brands are intermediated in one way or another, right? I mean... Starbucks has a direct relationship, but most brands don't. They're intermediated in one way or the other. What is consistent is that all of them talk about the desire to kind of own that customer relationship. But in the same way that we started talking about things at the beginning of this conversation, we said we kind of conflate words. I actually think more and more that, that the words matter and that the words that we used for marketing around owning the relationship, they might not even be the right way to think about it because actually what we're really doing is empowering people 
to have that direct relationship and to opt in because it's the people who are going to choose to maintain the relationship with these brands. The brands aren't going to own the data. They are enabling a path or have I got this completely wrong? No, I mean, I would agree with that, that the concept of Starbucks owning their relationship with me is ridiculous. I, I live in New York City. There's coffee shops everywhere. Starbucks does not own any relationship with me. Although I, I will say that if I'm walking down the block and that there's an unknown and then a Starbucks option, I will probably go to Starbucks and maybe like some degree of loyalty actually gets my lizard brain moving in that direction where now I'm moving into Starbucks based upon what they've delivered in the past and the reputation that they have. I think where this, I have many conversations, I'm sure you do as well, with brands that they want to explore on blockchains and they want, maybe they even have like an understanding of the public nature and how they work and how they, what their role would be. But in almost every case, I have a conversation with that same brand that, you know, they want to, they want everything else to be public and decentralized except for their stuff. And they want that to be centralized. So can we do this in a way where my data is private and I am centralized, but everything else will be decentralized and we're going to see some interesting experiments. So what Starbucks is doing, I think will be interesting because Starbucks is going to create a membership contract. That membership contract is going to be on the Polygon network. That contract address will be public for anyone directly or indirectly to create experiences for Starbucks members. And if I was Dunkin' Donuts or Phil's or uh, any large coffee company, I would be thinking about what is my strategy on the day of launch to take that contract address and like drop something to all Starbucks members, something special like a guerrilla marketing campaign of you eat everyone gets 10 free coffees at my shop or a dollar off or whatever that discount could be. Something that would be really splashy and would get a lot of attention about this is why Starbucks shouldn't do this. And I, I really hope somebody's doing it because I think it's going to be a colossal failure. And the reason I think it will be a failure is it will actually build value in that Starbucks membership because others are providing things to them. And that's actually what I think is going to happen is once we start to publicize, once we start to use public blockchains in order to identify someone as being a member of an ecosystem, it then democratizes anyone that wants to create experiences for those people and builds value in the thing that you're a member of. These experiments need to play out in order for that story that I told to actually become proof. But I see that level of, kind of membership value creation really happening through those kind of indirect relationships. If you're getting things from being a member, either from a discounting perspective, just for being a member. And, and that's not even talking about the wall to wear experiences on the outside of that. Like imagine what innovation could happen with just consumption if anyone could now create programs for Starbucks and like tap into what Starbucks has. I don't know what those experiences could be, but I'm here for them. The idea that actually the value of your membership, sure, there's a direct value, but if that contract is public and other people in trying to steal and capture your attention, see that membership as a channel, then that becomes, that membership becomes infinitely more valuable because all of a sudden the person who got it, it's an entirely new channel for them to receive value. Not sure the value might come sometimes from competitors, but why should I have your competitors token if all i need is to have your token to get your value and their value that's a powerful place to be to own both relationships it really forces you to create value and this is most of the tokens that nfts have been created to date have lifetime or perpetual access where somebody a creator whoever that is has sold something that now the expectation as a buyer is you're going to deliver things to me forever like well, I paid you X and now this is a forever relationship. And we, I think we know how that's going to end because there, there's no revenue coming into one of those projects. It's challenging for them to create value. And I think the reason that a lot of those lifetime access tokens were created is there wasn't a lot of thoughtfulness around the value that was going to be created. The product was speculation. And that works when speculation is 
creating an increase in token value. But when your token's going down in value and there's no reoccurring revenue, and the only thing you can do is spend money through your treasury in order to create additional value, that, that becomes a challenge. Like in the history of humanity, there's never been a sustainable business that's operated that way. Maybe tokens change that. I don't think they do, but I, I could be wrong. I think we're seeing evidence they probably don't. We'll not dive back into that subject. So you've given some pretty some pretty great stories on kind of the experiments that you actually think are going to be possible and where this plays out. Do you have where do you see yourself building towards if there's a, a big vision in the sky? It's good because it's all programmed on a computer in the sky. So I, I, I like where you're going with this. So the experience has to be the reason, not the tech. The tech is fascinating to me, but like I'm an oddball. And I'm not the end user of somebody who's going to be using this technology to do things. When better experiences are facilitated by technology is when we see kind of greater adoption. And right now, the UX is poor, but it's definitely improving. And all technologies are going through these phases. So in the early 90s, I grew up in a small town in Idaho. And my outlet to the world of Idaho in the United States for those people is a, a large state with few people in the United States of America. But I had a dial-up modem and I would use this dial-up modem in order to connect to the internet. Uh, if you're not familiar with the dial-up modem, those are the things you maybe have heard about. It goes, ear, 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 those types of sounds. But you would use that using a phone line in order to connect to the internet. When you connect to the internet, it was typically a text-based interface of bulletin board systems where you would chat and post and do things like in a really like rudimentary way. And it was ugly, and it was clunky. Every time my mom picked up the phone, I, it would kick me off the internet and I'd have to redial and reconnect. But it was awesome because it provided me a way to communicate with people from all over the world through this magical new network. And more people started using it, and now the internet is what it is today. And I think we're kind of in that dial-up modem phase of kind of interacting with blockchains. One of the big unlocks, I feel, will be when the app is the wallet. So if you were a brand like Starbucks, your application actually becomes the wallet. So you're not introducing new concepts to people that are not crypto native. It's just like a concept of an account. Like you're not even calling it a wallet. It's, this is your account. And in your account, you have a membership or you have a card. And then with that card, you can redeem it for things. Maybe you're earning stuff as well, but there's no crypto babble in that conversation. It's more about what is the experience and then how is it better? And that's, that's where we're going to see people jump in. And within that stage, we're right now in the dial-up modem phase. There weren't a huge number of brands that were diving in at that stage, but there were a few that were starting to play, starting to experiment. What do you think are the experiments? Like if people wanted to experiment with Unlock Protocol right now as a brand, what are the types of experiments that you think are really fit for purpose right now for a brand? That's a really great question. And I feel like I spend most of my time talking people out of using NFTs because they lead. The reason being is a lot of projects start with like, I want to use NFTs. I want to use Web3. So let's start there and go. I think if brands thought about what do I want to create? Who do I want to be? What do I want people to do? How do I want to represent this community that I'm creating? And then when you start thinking through that exercise of what value that you can create, then you can think about, does it make sense to use blockchain to do this? And the answer normally is yes, because typically you want to do more than just something on a single static website. You want to be across multiple channels. And if you want to take people across multiple channels, it's much easier to do that with blockchains than it is with multiple fragmented customer databases and you setting up, you asking people to set up accounts everywhere across digital and physical spaces. It's taking existing programs that maybe just didn't work, like any community efforts, membership type programs. Like what is that saying and what value could we offer in order to bring people closer to us? And could you facilitate that through blockchain? So it's, it's really the experience piece. The technology barrier is fairly it, it's fairly easy to set up. In terms of Unlock Protocol, we have a dashboard that we recently launched that within a minute, you can create and deploy a smart contract that acts as a vending machine for memberships 
clicking a couple of buttons with the only barrier to entry being like, do you have an internet connection? And if you have an internet connection, you can set up a contract. And then with that contract, you can create a link that people can create or buy NFTs. So the technology isn't the challenge. It's the imagination that we need to inspire in order to think about why we're actually doing this. What's the purpose and who is supporting this? Like what energy and effort are we putting into this? Just like any other campaign, you're going to get out of it what you put into it. Further we move away from being able to just interrupt people, the more important that experience becomes. But whether even before that, when we were just talking about interruptive media, it was still the creative work that gets remembered, that gets people's attention, that captures the imagination. I'm thrilled by what you're building. I think that's going to unlock some amazing experiences. One final question, which really does kind of get to the heart of how people start, and that's the tech sounds easy. If all I need is an internet connection, is that really all that's needed? What do you think a brand really needs to have in place? If they were going to come and, and start, what do you think the prerequisites really are? Yeah, I would take a look at what is the brand currently doing today? And what could be improved if there was kind of more of a network effect around that concept? So easy buttons would be any kind of existing membership or community program. Like, what is that today? Where are people, what are the channels? What do we own? What, what space are we leasing? Where are we paying a lot of money in order to interact with people within these spaces? Is it possible that we could kind of pare down what we're doing across all of these walled gardens and kind of bring someone into more of a shared space that we could create from an organizational perspective? Like, who are those? Like, who are the champions? Like, this goes back to... Like the reason that the reason that Starbucks and Time Magazine are going all in on Web3 is their senior leaders are all in on Web3 and they've bought into this concept. So like who is that executive lead that's going to champion the project? And then what is the organizational structure and what is that support? And I with time-based projects, there's a kind of there's an expiration date. So there's a constraint of we have to deliver something within this time frame, much easier to accomplish than the let's do something forever and then support that forever, which is scary, challenging, if not impossible for any brand to authentically do that. Yeah. And we've seen quite a few brands actually get some bad press for launching something and then not maintaining it. As you say, the, the time-based thing fits with the existing campaign mentality. Things are finite and that's that. But it also drives better revenue because ultimately we're in business not to sell something once and provide a service forever. Most people want to want that recurring revenue model. I think it fits with the business model a whole lot better. Yeah, the social contract that you have with someone on the other side is truly a social contract. This isn't a light engagement of someone following you on Twitter or liking a page on Facebook. This is somebody saying that, here is a contract that this entity has, and I'm going to claim and be a part of this thing. And it's very clear what are the rules of engagement there for everyone, for all parties involved. Well, I look forward to uh, my New York Times membership starting to give me access to discounts with all of their advertisers in a gated marketplace that's really just for me and ideally actually opening up some doors to events, to make some good things happen for me as well. So if you're listening, New York Times, I'm looking <laughs> forward to it. Um, <laughs> but listen, no, Patrick, seriously, thank you so much for the time. I think that what you're building is hugely exciting. I'm thrilled to be learning from people like you and look forward to uh, what comes next. Yeah, we definitely protocol. appreciate your time. Thank you thanks so much. For the, thanks for the support. If you need to find us where uh, I'm available on all the things at, at Patrick Workman, and you can find Unlock Protocol at unlock-protocol.com. And I will make sure that all of the links are in all of the podcast notes and all of that so you can find Patrick very easily. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining everyone. That was Patrick Workman from Unlock Protocol. I don't know about you, but that's given me a lot to think about, a lot to reflect on, and more importantly, it's given me a lot of ideas for what we can do with brands. Hope it's done the same for you. Hope you've got some ideas percolating, and I look forward to seeing what you guys are all going to build. Now, thanks for joining today. You've been listening to the Brand But Next podcast where I talk to builders, innovators, leaders who are scaling Web3 and working to ensure that it delivers on its positive potential. If you enjoyed listening, you can subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. If you really want to help me out, I'd really appreciate a five-star review. 
it just helps with everything in terms of getting the word out and in terms of connections. If you really want to find out more and stay in contact, you can also subscribe to the accompanying Brand Next newsletter at brandnext.substack.com. All the links are in the show notes. I thank you very much for your time today. Keep those ideas going. Keep thinking forward. Keep building. Until next time, take care. Thank mm-hmm. you.